Well, hey everybody, and welcome back to class. We are already at module number five. The semester is rolling right along. And here we are at module five, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Let me, as I always do, just give you a few highlights through this little mini lecture video. And I hope that you're doing well, hope that you're finding your way around the classroom and that so far you're learning a little bit about problems of children and adolescence, as I've said a couple of times, again, in these modules, we're kind of just hitting the high points of several different types of common issues that we see amongst kids and teenagers. And so, again, we're kind of hitting just some basics and then we're moving on to the next one, moving on to the next one, because we have so many things we want to talk about. And this topic of this module, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, sometimes still referred to as ADD, is one of those topics, like many others in, in this class, that really we could spend a long time talking about. There is so much good information to talk about with ADHD. My hunch is you already know a lot about this particular problem, which is an actual diagnosis that we see. It is an example of a developmental disorder. It's the last one we're going to talk about. We've already talked about um, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and autism spectrum disorder, and now ADHD, all of these are developmental disabilities and that they are unique to children and adolescents as far as when the symptoms begin. Now, as is the case with the other three we've talked about, ADHD is also a, a disorder where people can struggle with the symptoms into adulthood. We're gonna talk about that here in just a second. But this is a developmental disability, a very well-known, a very commonly experienced and commonly diagnosed um, Developmental disability, ADHD. Let me ask you this before we get started. What do you already know? What comes to your mind when you think about ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Maybe you think of a young child who usually we think of a boy, <laughs> a young child who is hyper and running around and loud and doesn't listen and may even be a little bit mildly destructive and has school problems or whatever it may be. Maybe you think of a child who is off in their own world and has a hard time just kind of paying attention and, and doesn't listen well, all of that. Maybe there's some other images that kind of come to your mind. I'm just going to say this up front. In my opinion, ADHD has kind of gotten a bad rap through the years. Um, I personally I have had a lot of experience working with kids who have ADHD, this disorder. And I, I think it's kind of gotten a bad rap. I'm a, little, I'm a little controversial. Here's how I'm a little controversial. I believe this is a real disorder. Not everyone believes this is a real disorder. There's a lot of people in our world today who do not believe that ADHD really exists. I do believe, because I've worked with kids. I've seen the proof of kids uh, who have the, 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 the problems, the struggles, the deficits uh, that, we, that we identify with ADHD. Um, so ADHD kind of gets a bad rap many times. And so just so that that's one of the basic truths I want to review with you up front is, number one, I believe it is a real disorder. Part of why ADHD has gotten a bad rap is because it has been overdiagnosed. Absolutely. I don't think anyone would probably disagree with that. It has been through the years overdiagnosed. I think we are doing a much better job in this current generation than we did, say, a generation or two ago. Many, many, many kids were told they had ADHD or many parents were told their kids had ADHD when in reality, maybe they didn't. So one of the reasons why, unfortunately, it gets a bad rap is it has been, it is it is an easy overdiagnosis diagnosis, if that makes sense. It's an easy label to kind of use when we don't really know what's going on in a kid's life. And so school teachers and counselors and even child psychologists and counselors and social workers sometimes, when they don't know what else to say about a kiddo and his problems, they say, well, he's kind of got ADD, I think. And so unfortunately, it's been, I think it's been overdiagnosed, although I do think it is real. Um, we talked about how it is a developmental disability. And so, again, the symptoms have to be present prior to the age of seven. Seven is the magic age with ADHD. You see that in your lecture notes this week. And so the symptoms have to be present in a child's life consistently prior to the age of seven. That does not mean, of course, that they have to be diagnosed prior to the age of seven. But when we do an assessment of a child where we think they may have ADHD, we always ask the question of, well, how long have these, have these problems been there? And we're always listening for prior to the age of seven. If it's after seven, then that's not only ADHD. I'm not sure what that would be. But we know that ADHD is a, is a development disability where the symptoms begin to show themselves early prior to the age of seven. And also, too, like learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, even though ADHD is diagnosed in childhood, the symptoms often uh, progress into adulthood. Um, I, don't, I don't have this in your lecture notes, but let me just give you the rule of thirds. 
uh, just that, that we sort of use with ADHD. What we found through the years with kids who are diagnosed with ADHD in childhood, about one third of them, that would be about three out of every 10, by the time they get into adulthood, their symptoms have basically gone away. So th those would be the cases where the symptoms were really, were, really, were really pretty mild to begin with. And by the time they get to 18, 19, 20, 21, 25, they don't have hardly any symptoms of ADHD at all anymore. About three out of every 10. Another three out of every 10 um, carry their symptoms. Their symptoms persist into adulthood, but they get lesser. They get more mild and they become more manageable. And people report, a lot of people who had ADHD as, as children will say, you know, now that I'm an adult, now that I'm an adult, I kind of still sometimes kind of struggle with having to, having to kind of focus my attention, but man, not anything like it was when I was a kid. So about three, another third, their symptoms are present, but they're more manageable. They're not quite as severe. And then the other third, the other three out of 10, um, the symptoms remain consistent all the way into adulthood. Maybe you are someone who that is that way. Maybe you know someone like that. I've had students before who have what we call adult ADHD. And what adult ADHD is, is those are the, that, that is that last third, that last three or so out of every 10 kids who are diagnosed with ADHD in childhood, their symptoms remain consistent and persistent all the way into adulthood. They're 30 something years old, 40 something years old, maybe even 50 something years old, and still they have a hard time listening and paying attention and still they have a hard time organizing themselves and still they have a hard time kind of being off in their own world and getting kind of hyper and, and having to kind of settle themselves down a little bit. And so so we see that these symptoms do can and do persist into adulthood, but not all of the time. Key idea here, again, just this is in your lecture notes. And so you can read more about this is this. ADHD is a complicated disorder that can really look a lot of different ways, but it is built around two different sets of symptoms that are often inter interwoven with each other. So we've already, we've already had some of that conversation in this class with other disorders of, the, uh, of what we call symptoms or or, or a list of, of, of types of problems that we oftentimes see with these disorders. So ADHD is that way. ADHD has two core problems, inattention and hyperactive slash impulsive behavior. And those two, th those two types of problems oftentimes are interwoven with each other. And in some kids, they're separate from each other. So about inattention. So number one, here's a key idea with ADHD. I'm gonna say this probably over and over again. Let me, let me give you this phrase. Persistent and disruptive patterns of age inappropriate blank. Persistent and disruptive patterns of age inappropriate. So again, the thing with ADHD, which is tricky, is we know, and I'll talk about this in the lecture notes, it's very typical for most average typical kids to have problems at times paying attention. And most average kids at times do their own thing. And most kids play by themselves and they can be kind of loud and rowdy sometimes. And sometimes they don't always stay in their seat when they're supposed to. And sometimes they don't always do really, really well in school like they should, right? And so every kiddo has at some level, some ADHD kinds of symptoms from time to time or maybe even somewhat consistently. So the key idea is, are those symptoms persistent? Are they disruptive? Are they strong enough and persistent enough that they cause disruption to the child or the family that, that the child is living in? And is it age inappropriate? If the child is seven, is the behavior we are seeing not what we would expect in a seven-year-old? If the child is 11, is the behavior, is the attention span that we are observing, is it what we would expect in an 11-year-old or not? And if the answer is no, by the age of 11 or 12, if our, if, if our client is 11 or 12, by age 11 or 12, they ought to be kind of here. But man, they're way down here. They still can't even complete one homework assignment without someone standing over and making them do it. By the time you get to 12 years old, you ought to be able to do that probably, right? Well, if, 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 the, if, the, if the symptoms are age inappropriate, persistent and disruptive patterns of age inappropriate inattention, and hyperactive slash impulsive behavior. So the first one is inattention. Again, that's kind of what it is, what it says it is. So one of the things we know is that all of us have an attention span. Now our attention span is, is, is uh, influenced by lots of things. Um, our attention span just means how long am I able to give my undivided attention to something? And even as adults, all of us have an attention span. And so the key, the, the, the tricky thing with attention span is this. Uh, if I'm tired, if I'm hungry, if I'm feeling sick, if I've got a lot going on in my world, if I'm not interested in what I'm paying attention to, well, then our, our attention span is going to be shorter. And that's typical for every single person. 
But the idea is this. We, we, we know that all of us have an attention span and we should be able to, in most situations, give our attention fully to whatever it is. The person talking to us, our homework assignment, the video that we're watching or whatever it may be. And so some people, and you know this, there are some people and the, the, admittedly that struggle with having a short attention span. I know someone who I'm close to, I'm, I'm close friends with. I don't know whether or not he has ADHD or not, but he will, he, for years, I've known him for years and he has joked and said, man, my attention span is like, like, like a gnat or a fly. You gotta keep me engaged, right? That's kind of what we would see. It's kind of what we see with ADHD is, is age inappropriate, persistent and disruptive patterns of age inappropriate inattention. And that could include just making careless, for kids, making careless mistakes on schoolwork, uh, often appearing off in a fog, off in kind of their own world, um, doesn't listen well. Now, again, I know many, many kids don't listen well, but again, is it a persistent thing that mom and a dad or a grandparent knows? You know, there's something, something I write here. This child is standing right next to me and I had a long conversation with them. And then two minutes later, they're asking me the same question. We just talked about that. That would be a concern. Does not, and, and patterns of that does not listen well. Overly disorganized in an age inappropriate way. Forgetful, easily distracted. Again, patterns of all of those or, or several of those are the kinds of things that we look for with ADHD. And we know there are kids starting at age seven all the way into adulthood that at, at times struggle with patterns of this inattention, patterns of, of poor or short attention span or inattention that are just outside the realm of typical, what we would expect, and they're disruptive and it's persistent. That's the first thing we would look for with ADHD would be patterns of inattention. The second is often interwoven with that, but sometimes it's, it's separate. And it is the hyperactive slash impulsive behavior patterns. So hyperactive is what it says it is, overactive, overly energetic and overly active. The word impulsive just means acts without thinking. Now, again, here's the tricky thing with ADHD. A lot of kids, even adults at times, are somewhat overactive and hyper. If someone's excited or they've had a lot of sugar or caffeine or whatever, they haven't had a lot of sleep, maybe they're kind of wired. That happens to all of us. And there are times when all of us sometimes can be spontaneous or impulsive again. But that's tr that's not normally the pattern, the persistent pattern for every single one of us. I may be sp spontaneous and impulsive occasionally, but that's not a characteristic of my behavior normally. That's just me. And it's probably true for you. Um, I may get kind of hyper and wired at times, but not all the time. That's not a characteristic of my normal, typical behavior. And that's probably true for you. But there are adults and there are kids that that is a characteristic of their behavior, a persistent, disruptive pattern of age inappropriate, hyperactive behavior or, and or impulsive behavior. So again, this can look a bunch of different ways. Kids are overly loud, uh, overly active, always on the go. One of the things with ADHD, sometimes I used to ask parents when I was working in a mental health clinic, we would do some ADHD assessments, is I would say, how hard is it to get your kiddo to settle down once they get wired? And, and, and parents say, oh my gosh. Once, once he or she gets wound up, getting them, getting them settled down and calmed down is like impossible. How hard is it to get them to settle down at night to go to bed? Now, some kids don't like to go to bed, but kids with ADHD will get will get hyper and act, especially late, late in the evening, and then getting them wound down to get in the bed and stop yelling and screaming is like really, really hard. That's typical for kids with ADHD, get, getting them to hard to kind of wind and kind of settle down, easily revved up. They go from zero to like 100, like in one step, as far as being kind of calm and then super, super excited, being real revved up and real easily kind of revved up. Um, acting without thinking, uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes with ADHD, kids may engage in dangerous, risky kind of behavior because they're impulsive. Um, again, I'm thinking of a situation from my childhood because I have a sibling who, um, who did not have, a, who was not diagnosed with ADHD because back in my day, um, we didn't diagnose kids with ADHD. But when I began to learn about ADHD as a, as a, as a, as a college student, I immediately began to think of one of my siblings. Because one of my siblings fit, is when we were kids, and even as an adult, fit every single criteria of ADHD. And I can remember this sibling jumping off the roof off a second, out of a second-story window, uh, just kind of on a dare, and hurting themselves. Um, I remember this uh, sibling of mine at a young age, you know, uh, engaging in risky behavior with fireworks and water and, um, you know, jumping on the back of cars while they were moving down the street. And just wild, almost kind of wild, kind of, and, and a lot of it, when, when I look back on it, a lot of it was just impulsive. 
seeing it, wanting to do it, kind of thrill seeking and not even thinking. And just, and, and oftentimes this was a sibling of mine who was always hurt. <laughs> he was always hurt going to the doctor, going to the ER, broken bones because of just this reckless, restless, impulsive behavior. Now that's an extreme example because not every kid with ADHD has to go to the hospital all the time, but those types of things are the kinds of things that we see. So persistent and disruptive patterns of age inappropriate inattention and then also to hyperactivity and impulsivity, those two things together. So again, symptoms present before the age of seven has to be pre in order. This is a key idea too. I also have this in your lecture notes. It, with ADHD, the symptoms are persistent across settings. In other words, ADHD is not, a child does not have ADHD if they're only hyper at home, but they're calm at school. Or they're only hyper at school, but calm at home. They're great at church, but not at home. That's not ADHD. ADHD is, is a disorder where, it, it, where the, the symptoms are present in at least two settings, usually home and school. They can be other places, right? So if school is real structured, they may do a little bit better there. But man, when they play soccer or they go to church or when we're, when we're with family or when they're at home, then they're kind of wild. So two or more settings. And, 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 and again, the symptoms have to be disruptive to the level that they're strong enough that they are disruptive. Okay. Lastly, too, let me, let me also just kind of review this again. This is all information that is in your lecture notes. Also, too, here are these three general presentations. This is kind of interesting, too. The presentation just means here is how ADHD often looks in people's lives. So remember, we have these two symptoms. The symptoms are patterns of inattention and patterns of hyperactive slash impulsive behavior. Some kids with ADHD have a mixture of both. They are both hyper slash impulsive and have short attention span. And we call that a, a, a combined presentation or the com ADHD combined type. And many, many kids have both the overactivity, hyperactivity, and, and, and impulsive behavior, and they have the poor attention kind of together, kind of a combo pack, right? Some kids, that, and, that, that, and that is a very typical presentation, they have both. But maybe you've known kids like this. Maybe you've known kids who aren't overly hyper, but they have poor attention. That's what we used to call ADD. Now that, now that now attention deficit disorder, that, that actual term doesn't even exist anymore. But we used to distinguish between ADHD and ADD. And ADD was the quiet kid off in his own world, not super hyper, but just more, you know, just more inattentive. Not a lot of hyperactive, impulsive behavior, more inattentive. And we see that today sometimes. So that would be called a predominantly inattentive type of presentation. A kiddo who has a little bit of hyperactive, impulsive, not much, but he's more inattentive. And he's more, he's more just easily distracted than he is hyper. And that's the second presentation, a predominantly inattentive type. And then the third, which is not very common, is the predominantly hyperactive type. So this would be a kiddo who has really good attention span. He's able to pay attention. He or she's able to pay attention, but real hyper and real impulsive, right? And so a, a predominantly hyperactive slash impulsive type of presentation, we see that as well, too. So those, those, so, so look for that in your lecture notes and sort of and, and be looking for that idea, of these three different presentations that we oftentimes see, a combined type, a predominantly uh, inattentive type and a predominantly hyperactive slash impulsive type as well too. Also, too, real quickly, one of the one of the one of the controversies we, we mentioned this a little bit when we talk about when we talked about autism spectrum disorder a couple of times back. Uh, there's all been all kinds of concern and confusion and, and research around what causes ADHD. I came into the field many many years ago when there was still an idea that poor parenting and bad diet and too many video games that's what causes ADHD. Well, that's not what causes ADHD. Now, that can cause attention problems, but that doesn't mean a kid has, kid has ADHD. ADHD is not caused by poor parenting. It is not caused by poor diet. It is not caused by too many video games or too much time on the computer. Now, those things, if you decrease those things in a child who has ADHD, for example, a better, less sugar, less, less, less stimulant diet, uh, less time on, on, on electronics, that can help manage some of the symptoms. But it usually, shouldn't take, it usually doesn't take the symptoms completely away. Uh, because we believe that ADHD is a brain-based chemical imbalance kind of a disorder that tends to run in families. There's a lot of genetic hereditary kind of connection here. We tend to see that, you know, that the kids who have ADHD have at least one biological parent, usually, who had some symptoms of ADD or ADHD when they were a kiddo. Interestingly, we think that ADHD is caused by an underactivity, an underactivity in the parts of the brain that kind of manage um, attention and focus and planning, we call executive functioning. And we think that what happens is there's actually an under, 
activity. I'm thinking of it like, like chemically and electrically. There's like, there's like, there's like an, under, an under activity. And that's part of why medicines like Ritalin and Adderall, which are stimulants, tend to tend to help people with ADHD is because we think that we think that those stimulant medications tend to regulate and kind of balance out that under activity that we see in the parts of the brain that kind of manage executive function, uh, planning, reasoning, uh, focus, attention, motivation, those kinds of things. The, uh, those parts of the brain that manage that we've sort of been able to identify. And we realize that with kids who have ADHD, there's like an under activity there, right? So very, very quickly, lastly, some really, really important, some really, really important issues. Um, just to kind of wrap up with this little mini lecture with number one, this is a diagnosis that we tend to see diagnosed more often in boys than in girls. Now, that's another somewhat controversial kind of an idea because there is an idea out there that just as many girls struggle with ADHD as boys do, but boys are just identified easier because boys tend to be more overactive anyways, and they're conditioned and, 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 and biologically oftentimes are more expressive, you know, in kind of how they play and kind of how they communicate. Girls are more uh, introspective oftentimes. And so kids, so boys oftentimes are diagnosed more often than girls, but we do see lots of girls who have the symptoms of ADHD, but they, but I, I believe that girls can hide those symptoms easier than boys can. So they, but it, it is a disorder that tends to be diagnosed in boys more um, than girls. We talked way, a way back about learning disabilities. And I mentioned in your lecture notes, the word comorbidity, the word comorbidity means occurs alongside. And one of the things that we've seen that that's really important to think about when you think about uh, ADHD is many, many kids with the symptoms of ADHD also have learning disorder symptoms and vice versa. Lots of kids with, with something like dyslexia, for example, a learning disability. Often many of those kids have ADHD kinds of symptoms as well, too, sometimes even strong enough to be diagnosed with both. So learning disabilities and ADHD often run together. We believe that happens because, again, a part of the brain that manages learning is also the part of the brain that manages attention. Because you know that attention is a part of learning. You're paying attention to something and giving attention to something is part of how we learn. And so, so, and so learning and, and, and attention, the parts of the brain that manage those two things are, are, are basically the same part of the brain. And so we, when we see learning disabilities, it kind of makes sense then that we may sometimes see problems with attention span. And so those two things kind of run together. Now, here's the thing. One of the, one of the myths is that, yeah, the reason why kids with ADHD don't learn is because they don't pay attention. That's, that's not really a learning disability. Kids with ADHD do struggle sometimes with keeping up and staying on grade level and learning, but that doesn't mean they have a learning disability necessarily. And so, so just because someone has poor attention doesn't mean necessarily that they, that they can't learn. So those are two separate things that have to be evaluated differently, but we oftentimes see those two things together. And then again, just similar to learning disabilities, here's the deal with ADHD. We sort of laugh about ADHD. We kind of see that we kind of, we, kind of, we, we oftentimes kind of lightheartedly talk about ADHD. Like learning disabilities, in my experience, uh, if ADHD is not caught and diagnosed appropriately and treated appropriately, it does and can lead to lots of negative outcomes later in life for kids. Uh, kids are at a much kids with undiagnosed, untreated ADHD are much higher and at risk to experiment with drugs, to have social issues, to have school related issues, to uh, to engage in any social criminal behavior, um, to have self-esteem kinds of and depressive kinds of issues, just like learning disabilities. If, if just just like just like a learning disability, if it's not caught and identified early on appropriately, it can lead to lots of negative outcomes. The same is true with ADHD. So we laugh about ADHD a lot of times. We don't see it very, very seriously. Often we don't see it even as a real disorder sometimes. But often, but, but I wanna highlight for you that this is one of those disorders that if it's not caught appropriately early on and diagnosed and treated appropriately, unfortunately it can and does lead to some negative outcomes in has the potential to in kids' lives. Does that mean that that's what's always happens? No, but it is. it is a common kind of a thing that we see oftentimes. So a little quick little mini lecture on ADHD. Go through, read your lecture notes, do your discussion question, do your homework assignment, read through the textbook information on ADHD, just kind of get your information kind of together, just raise your awareness on what this disorder is, and come back next week for our next module, and I will see you then. All right, have a good week.